Hey folks, good morning. Glad to see everybody. Man, we already got a crowd in. Um, happy to see everybody. Please make sure you click on that share button. Uh, smack some of those emojis. Let your friends and network know that you're watching this because uh, this is going to be a good one. I missed you all. Uh, I took last week off. Um, so back in the rat race today. Got to love a Monday. I need more coffee. But that said, we got enough people in. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, good morning, everybody. My name's Sam All. If you don't know me, I'm the managing uh, partner for 11FS for the Americas. Welcome to episode 99 of the 11FS FinTech Insider Breakfast Show. 99 of these. As you know, in this show, we bring you the best and the brightest from around the FinTech and banking landscape every single weekday. Straighten your homes at 8.30 British Standard Time, apart from Mondays and Wednesdays, when I take over the show at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Both shows are always live here on LinkedIn. Uh, easiest way to, to know when these are coming up and who the guests are going to be, just subscribe to 11FS here on LinkedIn. Follow us on Twitter. And I also want to highlight the 11FS Daily Brief that we do here on LinkedIn. Every morning at 8.30 a.m., we post a short video summarizing three news stories from the past 24 hours that caught our attention and should have yours. Today's breakfast brief highlights the Capital One data breach fine. Uh, our guest, Chris, and I will probably talk about that a little bit. Uh, Bank Mobile's partnership with Google and Amazon's potential expansion into U.S. shopping malls. They're going to be setting up fulfillment centers and grocery stores where Sears and J.C. Penney's used to anchor stores. And man, if that's not the definition of irony, um, <laughs> I don't know. What is, and by the way, if you think that sounds crazy, 71% of the U.S. population lives within 10 miles of a Sears or a Kmart. And that was as of 2013. You put in uh, Amazon's partnership with Whole Foods, and you got a massive distribution network just sitting there. Uh, so crazy. All right. All that said, let's get our guest on today. I am thrilled to be joined by my good friend, Chris Brummer, Dr. Chris, Professor Chris, whatever you want to call him. Uh, he's from Georgetown Law. He also does a million other things. One of them is the host of the FinTech Beat podcast. Chris, how is the weather in D.C.? I assume you're in D.C. I am in D.C. Uh, it, it's beautiful today. You know, there there hasn't been a hurricane in at least <laughs> 10 or 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in Jacksonville, they always just bypass us. Or it's like, a, you know, cat one. We never get anything major here. Thank God. Uh, the other thing I forgot to tell everybody, let us know where you're at. Um, give us a shout out in the comments section. Please note where you're at in the world. Chris, you're going to love this, man. We get, we get, we have regulars for the U.S. show. So we have Dr. Abdullah, who's in Saudi Arabia. We nice. have Dan Finney in London. Um, you know, uh, Sid Rahar is out in San Francisco. It's kind of neat. So a very consistent audience that love to watch this show. And I guarantee you will stump us with questions. And that's the important part, folks. In the comments. Let's let's stump Chris. Okay, I know he's a professor. I know he's got his doctorate. I, I hey, think usually I, I you know I'm, when I'm a law professor, we we our entire goal is to say, well, well, what do you think? We're kind of like the psychologist. Oh, that's sad. Academy yeah. or something. Yeah, let's talk about that. All right, let's talk a little bit about yourself. Um, uh, we we talked early on, right before the show, that you grew up in Arkansas. At what point did you know you wanted to go into law? You know, you know that's a really interesting question. So I, I went to 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 um, actually to graduate school, and I I was working on a couple of issues related to international development, but it was really the, the history of of international development. And I was over in in uh, what is today Namibia of all places, which is amazing country. Uh, beside the fact that Angelina Jolie and 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 the others sort of went oh, there. Yeah. Famous. But but yeah. it's like you have like these sports where like sand duning and like but it was a really really interesting country and uh, when I was there I was I was in graduate school learning about like German history like or sort of German imperialism in Africa and I was like so, I know don't it's just wow. yeah weird weird topic but uh, I you know I was I was a weird kid so you know and I thought it was like really super interesting and just sort of looking around I said you know it's really cool to know about stuff in the past but I like. What can you do today to actually make the world better and, and more interesting? And, you know, I, I thought to myself, you know, I thought about things like management consulting and I thought about like how, you know, international development and everything. And then I said, well, I don't really know anything. So I'll, I'll, I'll go to law school now, whether or not that was the right choice or not still remains to be seen, but um, it was a way to get a, a bit of a skill set. 
um, to sort of think about, well, how do you sort of put things in, in motion? And I think that's in part why I like fintech so much. Yeah, and I love the the fact um, that you've, you've lived abroad too, right? You talked about um, living in Germany a little bit as a kid. That's where the Arkansas accent went, everybody. Evidently, if you learn yeah. to speak German, your Southern accent goes out the window. Um, but, but having that chance to live abroad as a professor, um, I know that is something I tell, I'm not a professor, you're a professor, but it's something I tell everyone, if you ever get the chance to live abroad, do it. Flat okay. out. Get out yeah. and experience other cultures, other... Um, uh, uh, other ways to study. It's fascinating when you see history from a different aspect. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and when people talk to, you know, and, and also when you, when you see your own country from other people's eyes, and then when you learn about other people's countries, it's great. It's fantastic. You yeah, know? I, I definitely agree. Um, hey folks, by the way, Hey, Wade Arnold, who's up in the mountains in golden Colorado. Hi, Wade. Hi. I'm Shout out to Wade. Assuming he still has the beard going. Craig, um, up in Atlanta, just, just a great, great group that is sitting out there. Um, and, and as part of this, so let's, I, I want to start, um, it, there, again, there's so many things we can talk about, but I want to talk about how I got introduced to you and I can't remember, it might've been Wade Arnold actually. I think it was Wade. Yeah. yeah, it was Wade. Cause Wade posted a link, uh, to a, a medium post that was put out there that you wrote. And I'm just going to start with the second paragraph, if that's okay. So I'm going to read what you wrote, Chris. You wrote the George Floyd killing by police in Minneapolis is one of those gut wrenching, painful moments now hitting home far too often, requiring everyone to take stock as to where we are, what can be done as we work for more, a more inclusive society. And the fintech community has this responsibility as well. And uh, what was the name of the article, Chris? Would you title it? I, I, I called it fintech's race problem. Yeah. Amen. So what is fintech's race problem, Chris? Yeah, you, you know, as as you sort of uh, read from 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 where I was coming from, you know, I I think everybody, you know, no matter who they are, uh, you, me, um, we have a responsibility right now just yeah. to to take a, a really deep look at, um, you know, our our country, our society. You know, what are we doing? Um, uh, fintech in particular, one thing that I've I've always been attracted to it and and really inspired by it is the community of innovators, um, people who are always willing to think outside the box, yeah. um, people who you know are sort of programmed to sort of look at things as they are and then sort of dream a little bit about how things might be. And you know when you think about a protracted problem like race, you know um, it, it's it's something that. Uh, you know, both as a scholar, but also as a member of this ecosystem, you you, you realize that there's so much uh, potential, and, and and even as I am an, a very active participant in this uh, community, and and I have friends throughout it, um, you know, it, it, it's it's very obvious that you know we're not living to or fulfilling all of our our potential, and 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 not delivering on certain kinds of aspirations that have really powered the industry. And you know, I, I you know, fintech's race problem is obviously a problem that we have in lots of different pockets of uh, society. Um, and different countries have their own sort of versions of it, you know, throughout the world. Uh, but but I really wanted in this piece to think about fintech's race problem because because precisely because fintech has always been built on certain kinds of aspirations of inclusion and certain kinds of aspirations of um, uh, of, of sort of breaking down different kinds of uh, financial barriers, uh, wealth barriers. And, and, and for us, for this community to have this particular problem, um, uh, you know, is, is uh, you know, something that we both have a duty to think about more seriously. And I think that we, we, we have an even higher obligation, if one will, you know, to, to think about it. Yeah, um, you, know, you know what I always find interesting, Chris? Um, because you know I've been around this space, you know, for a while. I'm a little gray. Um, it's, when fintech really shut up, so after the collapse in 2008, right? I think we all will agree that's when really we saw uh, fintech really escalate. It had been around before then, by the way, folks. It's not like it suddenly <laughs> popped up in 2008. I think the name stuck around 2008, 2009. But you know, I, I think a lot of us have looked at this, and there was a lot of talk about how fintech was going to democratize. Um, you know, finances and financial services, how 
that you were going to see inclusion, how you were going to see solutions that could bring more people into the banking system. And we have seen that. Let's let's not knock that. Right. Um, especially I think where we've seen it more, though, is not in the U.S. I think we've seen this throughout Latin America, especially in Africa with solutions like M-Pesa. We've seen this in India at scale. Um, hell, China has exploded when it comes to solutions that fit in that market. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and my, give you my personal view. I don't think we've seen anything like that in the U.S. Yeah, you know, and 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 it's it's weird. Even though we've been the center of enormous innovation, right? We, yeah. we you know, some of that innovation hasn't trickled down to right. to 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 those people who who need it most. And you know, I, I look, and one of the things I said in that particular article is, is something that I I tell people all the time. You know, fintech is really interesting because on the one hand, you have to scale, right? You know, yeah. when you think about all of our solutions and fintech solutions, you need scale. But th that scaling demand is happening at the very same time that you need more customized solutions. You know, a, a, the, the digital economy, digital finance has, you know, inspired people into including customers to demand more from their financial services providers. And so there's this paradox within fintech. You know, the paradox is how do you scale and at the same time deliver on more customized solutions to people? And I, and I think that that is um, not just a technology problem, you know, it is um, a challenge of, of human capital. And, you know, it's like, you, you, frankly, you need that human capital in the process of product design, in the process of, you know, data, um, you know, creating data fields, reading your data, you, you, you need all of that. Um, you know, just create slapping some APIs on it just just won't, isn't in and of itself <laughs> enough, right? Yeah. Uh, and 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 at the same time, you know, you need that in order to scale as well, right? I mean, to break into new markets and to design products for these for 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 you know new customers. And um, I, I I look at, at at fintech as having so much potential, um, uh, but again, when you go into lots of rooms, whether or not, you know, you're looking at who's getting funded in terms of founders, when you look at the VC shops, um, <clears throat> when you look at our regulators, you know, you, 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 you look at this system and you're saying, wow, you know, we're really not delivering on, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of, <clears throat> sorry about that, uh, we're not delivering on, in terms of the, the, the kind of, of participation that we need in order to achieve the business strategy and even almost cultural uh, goals that have always kind of driven, at least at, at, at the very least, our, our our rhetoric. And and as as a result, you know, I when I think about fintech's race problem, it's a different it's a different kind of thing. You know, I I don't think that when M and A came about, people thought immediately, yes, this will be you know deliver in terms of breaking down barriers all the time. But fintech did, you know, like yeah. fintech was about um, new kinds of communities. Yeah, if you don't think we have a a issue um, when it comes to this is my take, everybody. You can yell at me when I say this, but if you don't think that we have an issue when it comes to uh, banking and fintech and financial services as a whole, because I'm throwing everybody into this, when it comes to diversity and race, when it comes to inclusion based on gender, you take your pick. Um, we're not going to have money 2020 this year. We all know that, right? But think back to all the different years that you went to money twenty, money twenty twenty. Just stand in that that one hall that leads you in uh, past the Starbucks where everybody hangs out and walks into all of this. And easily, I'm going to go ahead and say this: easily, ninety percent of the people walking that hall look like me. Just going to say that because it's a fact. Because I've been to money twenty twenty since it started. Um, you know, it it is a predominantly white male dominated conference. It's not money 2020's fault whatsoever. It's just a reflection of the space that that we're in. Um, you, you, you highlighted this, Chris, um, in the piece, but you, you just took a, a, a look at what was happening in DC where you live. Yeah. You, you, know, know. you know, you saw the numbers, right? When you look there. Yeah, I mean, you know, and Washington D.C., you know, is is one of the most educated cities, yeah. you know, in the world. I mean, the, the the number of educated African Americans, you know, is 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 enormous. But even when you look at our our, you know, the the VC community here, uh, you know, I was just running some numbers through Crunchbase. And I was looking at the demographics, and if you were to look at the top twenty um, 
VCs uh, here in the in, in the city, um, only five of them had any African American senior executive, right? And uh, and and when they did, they only had one. Yeah. So you know, and, and this is in Washington D.C. So um, uh, if, if it's not here, it's certainly not going to be in other uh, cities as well. And I think that there's a a tendency at times to sort of say, okay, well, it's a Silicon Valley problem. And I think it's 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 a U.S. problem. So yeah. you, you know, uh, p again, part of it is you know, particularly for a an ecosystem of innovators, right? You know, if there's anyone who's sort of situated to think through these kinds of problems in a new and innovative way, it's the fintech community, both because of financial and business strategy necessity, but also because of just literally the the DNA of the people who are participating in it. Um, you, you know, and, and I, I think I think that, again, um, given the national discourse and I guess the heightened attention, th there will be uh, hopefully more done. And I and, and let me just say that, um, you know, we we're talking about Wade and others. You know, I, I it's hard for me to emphasize how many people have been in touch with me, you know, about this problem since since that particular piece. I mean, almost every every day or every other day. Uh, there are people who are who are thinking seriously through that, and and I think that there that there is now uh, some movement, but but part of it has to be just an awareness of not only the fact that we have a problem, but how especially problematic it is for fintech to have this problem. Yeah. And, and again, when you look at other parts of the world, you know, in Africa, when you look at Southeast Asia, there's been much more done to deliver in terms of financial access to the, not just the unbanked, but the underbanked, you know? Um, but when you think about the world of everything from uh, banking, financial services and payments, when you think about robo advising, when you think about um, uh, really, you know, this new concept of platform money and, and what kinds of services it can provide or, or artificial intelligence and credit scoring. I mean, all of these thing, kinds of things, the, the enormous potential that it does have, you know, it has to be uh, unlocked. And, uh, you know, uh, nobody has a monopoly on all the good ideas. And, and you have to make sure that people are in on the, uh, you know, in, in the design of, 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 of uh, both financial products and thinking through, you know, where money can be, the capital can be deployed for its, bet, for its best gains. You know, and, and I, I think that if, if, if you don't do it, we're, we're literally all going to be poor for it. All right, I'm setting you up here. You ready, Chris? I told you the questions would be freaking good. And they are. Sidrahar, I miss you so much, dude. So Sidrahar, uh, mm -hmm. great uh, company founder um, out in San Francisco, always asks incredibly good questions. And here we go. So I'm going to take this slow, Chris, because there's a lot to unpack okay. here. So Sidrahar, I'm playing devil's advocate. Why are we looking at fintechs to solve the issue of financial inclusion when this may be a far broader societal problem? than the one that can be solved by a clever business model or technology. Leaving this to for-profit companies means a patchwork of solutions that may help, but do not solve the problem. Do we need financial rights, and that's in quotes, financial rights codified into law the way civil rights were codified into law for this to have a shot at being successful? Go. Yeah, you know, I mean, that is an excellent, excellent question. And, you know, uh, just to, I'm gonna break that in, into two parts. Uh, number one, uh, you know, I have been very vocal at saying that this is uh, not just a a private sector problem. Right. Um, and you know, one thing that I it, you know I I done when looking at our our regulators, and then I'll get to the question of of, of rights in just a second. But um, I did like a twenty page sort of study in which I I you know put on an Excel sheet with some a, a couple of uh, of folks uh, looking at the number of um, black regulators that there have been uh, in the United States government, financial regulators. So looking at the Federal Reserve, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the CFTC, the FDIC, the Comptroller of the Currency, those kinds of folks, because these are, are people who are entrusted with thinking through things like interest rate policy, who gets bailed out, what are the terms under which people get bailed out, uh, you know what kinds of disclosures companies should make in terms of 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 their own business practices and the like, right? So so these are people completely, for whatever the reason, uh, you know, ignored in conversations on um, the racial income and wealth gap. 
but you know, people who have who are literally charged with helping to design how capitalism operates, and and you know, creating rules that may seem very transparent but may still for one reason or another have like a disparate impact. And, and just sort of looking at, well, well, who's been at the table for designing those, those rules? And so then I created like a couple of charts and a study uh, that I put up on, on SSRN. And within a day, you know, the Wall Street Journal had covered it in, in their A block, because it turns out that within 10, sorry, uh, over the last 90 years since the New Deal or modern regulatory agencies, there have only been 10 out of 327 um, leadership positions, never the head of an agency. Yeah. And these are the people who are sort of at the table. And when you go deeper into the data, it gets even worse. So, you know, there was a, you know, a comment, not, not from my study, but a study, or, or at least a comment of, of maybe two or three days later by saying that when you look at the Federal Reserve of the 406 economists, only one is black, right? You know, it doesn't sound like, it, this doesn't sound important, but it gets directly into what you're, what you're getting at, which is number one, what rules, if one will, like do we have on the books in terms of our financial regulatory policy? And then secondly, how are those rules being interpreted in a way so as to ensure that everybody is actually participating in, and, and by the way, I'm not even right at this point, I'm not even getting into like higher civil rights parlance right now. Yeah. I'm talking about from a matter of just pure economic efficiency, right? Are, are we having the input required in our in our economic and regulatory decision right now, uh, dis, uh, decision making, even with the even with the rules that are on the books right now, as to ensure that they are being interpreted in a way so that we're taking into consideration how they're affecting every sort of pocket of, of, of productivity in the economy. And, and I think that, um, you know, I, I, I kind of joked about the, the, the study and the fact that I ended up in the Wall Street Journal because all I did was spend 20 pages telling people that the sky was blue when all they had to do was sort of look up. You know? <laughs> yeah. but, but, you know, there is a, a, a certain sort of basic, not controversial question here, which is, okay, you know, how informed is your decision making, right? Like just on, on the basis of pure policy. And then, you know, so, so, you know, after we are able to even determine that, which at this point in time, we can't, because there's right. no one there, there, there's no, we don't even have, I, there's not even enough data for me to run regressions. That's how bad the numbers are in terms of sort of representation. That, that, you know, you have to ask that threshold question and then you can get to questions like, okay, you know, um, what are the specific expectations that we should have uh, on our companies uh, in terms of the existing laws, in terms of, again, their disclosure, their rules, you know, our VC industry, in, industry you know, um, what are, are they or, you know, are we fulfilling fiduciary duties to our investors and others when we're not necessarily looking at investments that actually may have higher returns, right? I mean, you know, McKinsey and other companies have done studies saying that, you know, companies with diverse boards have been outperforming those that are homogeneous, right? And so like, you know, yes, there's, a, there's certainly a necessary conversation about, you know, what economic rights should be, but there's also a necessary conversation about what our economic rights are right now and obligations, and are these obligations even being fulfilled with what we have on the books, right? Yeah. Um, and, and and these are kinds of questions that uh, uh, are not no longer just the realm of sort of nerdy academics, but I mean like real people who are trying to you know deliver for their investors, uh, people who are trying to deliver for you know for their limited partners, you know they're they're, they're thinking through seriously. And I think that the fintech industry, again, has, has an obligation to, to think through as well. Yeah, I, I agree, man. And, and it's frustrating, right? I mean, it's, I'm just going to say this. It's flat out frustrating. Um, what's where we're still at, you know, it's 2020. Um, there's not a day that doesn't go by where, you know, we're, we're not seeing um, it, it, you know, we're not seeing, you know, protesting that's happening, social unrest that's happening. Chicago uh, last night, you know, uh, had a, uh, a, a police shooting where we're, we're finding out more information about what took place. Um, but a lot of looting that took place in a city I love, by the way, absolutely love Chicago. Love um, yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, you know, I, it's, it's, it's incredibly frustrating because, um, 
uh, my personal experience, I lived in the UK when President Obama was elected. Um, so I was I was living in, in New York at the time. Um, and after the election, I had folks, um, uh, folks that were English come up and hug me. And I'm like, why? <laughs> I did. I, I voted. But I mean, you know what I mean? And they're just yeah. like, you know, we can see change. And I remember looking at them and saying, um, hey, I, I don't I don't know. You know, I, I don't know. You're taking a single a single point in time, a single event and saying that changes everything. And for me, the most frustrating thing is inertia and complacency. And, and I mean that uh, for me, it is it is complacency. It, it is saying, hey, I hired this black woman. You know, we've had Arlen uh, Hamilton on this show, uh, black investor with uh, Backstage Capital. Um, let me keep adding to that woman, gay. Um, not a Stanford grad, not a Georgetown grad, you know what I mean? Um, completely outside the system coming in and trying to make change. So as I think that's what frustrates me the most is a sense of complacency and that things are okay when we know they're not. It, the complacency and, and sort of thinking it's like somebody else's problem where, it's, yeah, where, it's, where pull, pull yourself up by your bootstraps well, and let's go. It's just hard it, work. And I, and I think that it's it's very very important. You know, this doesn't get solved unless we all kind of pitch in, right? Yes. You know. Um, Amen. You, you know, there's it's just one of those things where you know, uh, you know, there are different kinds of sort of game theory kind of questions where people say like, are you know, and and this is what you call sort of like the weakest link problem, right? You know, where you're on an island, nice. you know, like the water is about to rise, and everybody has their own little plot of land, and everyone has to put a little wall up. Well, the, the entire protection of the island depends on who puts their wall down the lowest, right? And and it's it's one of those things where, you know, if we all don't sort of systematically think through and develop our own sort of herd immunity at the at a very minimum, you know, to, to this problem, you know, it, it, it's not going to go away and it's going to fester. And I and I do think, you know, that there are certain kinds of things that that uh, uh, and again, I you know to 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 the earlier question on on is this? It's certainly not fintech's sole responsibility. It is right. responsibility. I'm just trying to challenge the, the community, one of the communities that I'm a part of and that I love. You know, the fintech community to to step up and to in, in a leadership way because I think that we're built in a way to deliver certain kinds of gain. So as a kind of example, um, you know, it's really hard to diversify large institutions. Like once you're Amen. big, it's just hard. It's just hard because yep. now, now you're at the stage where you have to think about numbers, right? And yep. you know, it becomes less, um, or I should say it becomes more impersonal and you're just sort of thinking about like, you know, org charts and large, and, and you know, when you get to talk about things like startups, you know, startups are the kind, are, are the world where, you know, if you can get a couple of people Again, entirely for achieving the kinds of outcomes that uh, you know from a business strategy pers perspective, but you can make sure that you're going through taking that extra step to build in diverse uh, people with, with with different ways of looking at things. You know, it, it kind of allows diversity to to grow organically before it has to become a, like a thing, yeah. <laughs> right? You know, yeah. and, and 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 you're it becomes part of that base layer infrastructure of how you're. How, how your firm operates. And I had a, I had a great person, uh, 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 his name is Brant Cooper on, on, on my podcast. And he had like this really interesting sort of way of looking at it where he was saying, in essence, uh, uh, you need a certain amount of, of innovation, right? Or, and, and difference of opinion in order to innovate. Like, like that yeah. in essence, innovation is its own production process. There's nothing, you know, magical about it. You have to put in your time and you have to work hard in order to innovate. And I, I sat back and I was sort of thinking a little bit more about it. And I think that um, too often, even our startups, and, and I, I talk just like you, I, I talk to startups every day, every day. And I talk to founders every day and I talk to CEOs every day. And, you know, Sometimes I think that it's easy because you're you're looking for capital um, to get caught up into this vision of your startup as a as a firm, and and the theory of the firm basically says we need to minimize 
all friction in every way possible in order to achieve you know this kind of efficiency that's why you sort of sometimes you right. vertically integrate and you hire people in order to, to avoid your friction you know and, and 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 i'm you know sort of working on this 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 idea where where maybe the best way to think about it instead of thinking of your your entity as the firm is to think of it as as a team and i think that the concept of a team is much more useful especially in a coronavirus decentralized uh, working environment but 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 the concept of, of, of a team is 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 more important because you you when you think about things as a team or even a team of teams you start to think about the innovation production process as one where you have to have some kind of creative friction in order to think outside of a box because we we all have our own bias like sort of cognitive biases right? we know our own limited experience and if, if you really want to if you want to scale and get customized solutions to more than one sort of segment of the population you, you kind of need a team to, to get that done and um you know again a lot of times we think about it um you know how can i how can i create a a, a, a technological sort of wraparound where that wraparound isn't nearly as robust as as you think. I mean, you may get data, but can you read it, right? Like, yeah. I mean, I mean, and 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 it, it kind of obstructs the 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 innovation process. And so, a, a lot of this is going. A lot of the changes that are going to come. And I and I I, I warn founders all the time. I say, yeah, right. Right now, you may be feeling really good. And I'm, you know, congratulations. You have like some capital from folks coming in, but there one day there's, there's going to be somebody who comes after you and 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 someone who who will have this understanding and uh, you know how you know you may be in a good position now but how well have you future proofed your your position and sometimes firms think that the only way to to future proof themselves is again uh you know by some kind of technological wrap around or they think that if they can get such a large market share that you know that that they're now creating some kind of network effect or oligopoly or some or monopoly sort of power yeah. or something, and I'm like, history shows that that's only temporary, right? And 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 someone's going to come and realize what you're not doing. So if you're really thinking about future proofing your gains, you really ought to think about very seriously what you're not doing, uh, yeah. because uh, you know. Uh, you you know enjoy it enjoy because otherwise enjoy it while 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 it lasts i mean yeah if you want to if you actually want a lasting legacy and i'll well, sum i'll summarize this as we're up against the clock if you really want a lasting legacy really build in diversity into the dna of your company and it's much easier when you're incredibly small and starting out i'm just going to say that and your company um it's as good as the people it just yeah. is people matter they still matter People matter. Man, people matter. All right. And with that, I'm, we're up against the clock, folks. Yep. We're gonna, yep. You can see why Chris and I like to chat so much. Um, it, we'll, we're going to send out links to Chris's podcast, which is the FinTech Beat. Definitely need to listen to that. Uh, we'll send out information on Washington, D.C.'s FinTech Week Conference, which, um, you know, Chris was instrumental in. Folks, thanks for being here. We love having you here. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to have uh, Adam Davis, the lovely sounds of Adam Davis. Um, who will be on at 8.30 a.m. British Standard Time. He'll be talking with Bella. Uh, with Bella. I'm going to go with Bella because there's no way I'm saying the rest of her name right. She's the CEO of Funscape. I think my producers do this to me on purpose. Everybody, thanks for being here. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow.